Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world in 30 Answers. Discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I'm sitting at the foothills of Mount George in Coombsville, um, AVA in Napa Valley, with Christian Palmaz of Palmaz Vineyards. Christian, welcome to Wine Soundtrack, and tell us a little bit about Palmaz Vineyards. Thank you for having me. It's a real honor to be here. Palmas Vineyards is a family-owned and operated winery based on 610 acres that go up and over Mount George. And uh, we, we have built a winery that is burrowed deep into Mount George, about an 18-story building. Uh, it's a very unique place to make wine. It is indeed a unique place. We've uh, toured this property prior to sitting down here, and as Christian was saying, 118 stories. We went down. Um, Ms. Deep, how many feet did we go down into the mountain? So the elevator shaft is about 240 feet deep, so equivalent to an 18-story building. Amazing. So um, you were saying how many acres of land do you have? How many acres are you growing grapes on, and how many cases of wine are you producing? What grapes? You know, Tell us a little bit about that part. So the property is... Uh, about we have we have exactly 64 acres under vine. We have all five Bordeaux. We have three whites: Riesling, Chardonnay, Muscat. We also have a little bit of Grenache for our rosé program. And uh, in case production, we uh, are right about 9,000 cases, or just a hair under. And then also with those um, vineyards, you're also talking about three microclimates. Yes. Yeah, so the vineyards are planted across three elevations. So down here, kind of closer to the valley floor, very transitional soil structures that we move away from the alluvial fans and up into the foothills of Mount George. Then we have this uh, beautiful crescent-shaped valley that wraps around one of the peaks of Mount George at 1,200 feet, and then another vineyard on the very peak of Mount George at 1,400 feet. So tell me, Christian, what is your first memory relevant to wine? (laughs) Definitely at the dinner table with my parents. So... Growing up in in my family, uh, every discussion around the dinner table was centered around the bottle on the table and where my parents were when they bought that bottle and and what they were doing and and how relevant that year was for that region. My parents are total wine geeks and at some point I started getting interested in wanting to know what all the fuss was about and so my father would play this game with me uh, we called the five things. So he would let me try the wine but I had to tell him five things about it. And sure, the first time it was silly, it was, it's purple, it's wet, it's, you know. And then as time got, went on, um, I, I got a little bit better at it. And uh, nowhere near uh, my sister, who is far, has far more of a better palate than I do. But uh, definitely the dinner table was the first a time I think I noticed wine as a kid. And do you remember the first or most memorable wine you've ever drunk and what that occasion was? Oh, that's a good one. Um, my parents would come back from long trips in Europe and uh, on special occasion evenings, whatever those were, uh, I remember for some reason the, the first wine that comes to mind mm-hmm. um, would be uh, some of the super Tuscans that my that my father particularly really had a soft spot for, and then of course some of the uh, the, the more expensive wines for us at the time were some of the the acclaimed Napa Valley wines that that those were for very special occasions. So traveling the world abroad, and I do know that your family is originally from Argentina. Uh, what is the best foreign wine you have ever drunk? I guess, as a cliche as it may sound. Um, it has to be one of the Grand Crus. Um, you know, there's just there's things to us that that we just don't we don't you know flavor profiles we don't we don't really often see here in Napa. So definitely one of the Grand Crus, probably you know circa 80, 86, 88 is probably the last time it was uh, you know eyes got a little wider. <laughs> Do you remember the worst wine you ever drank and where it was from? <laughs> no, we never speak about the worst wine we've ever had. And I'm definitely not going to even pick a region on that one. So, so no, I, I you know, the, the, probably the worst wine I've ever uh, had was probably made by a friend of mine in his garage. And, uh, and but those are the ones you have to love the most. <laughs> right. And he's now a very famous winemaker, right? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, among all the populations of the world, who do you think drinks the best in terms of quality? You know, I, I, I think that's changing. Um, I, I think, 
you know, we would probably say uh, that originally, maybe 20 years ago, uh, I would give that to, um, you know, it, probably the EU, the whole area. Uh, the, 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 obviously, had, had had wine built in their culture uh, and high-end wines built in their culture. But uh, Americans these days are uh, expecting more and more quality out of the wines they're buying. But now, uh, with China becoming a, a big uh, force to be reckoned with in terms of uh, consumers, um, you can argue that the Chinese are up there with with some of the greatest consumers around the world, and, and uh, quality is a demand everywhere now. Are you collecting any wine? Have you built up a cellar of your own? I have to say, you know, my, my wife and I um, approach collecting wine in, the, in an irresponsible way. Um, we, we we pretend that we're putting away some wines for, you know, for our for our four year old and 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 you know the want to leave him a, a cellar. But I have to admit, we are not doing it as uh, focused and determined as my parents did when they were my age. And um, you know, we, we there are definitely some wines that we are. Uh, cellaring, but I have to admit, I think they cellar because we forget about them more than we remember uh, or purposely set them aside, you know, for for the twenty year long run. Um, so it's it's good to have, you know, my cellar co- collection philosophy is have a messy cellar that surprises you with things you've lost. So have you found anything recently that's tasting really good? I did actually have a, um, a Castel de Banfi recently that was parked in the very back of, 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 of a dusty uh, cellar under my house and uh, it was a uh, it was a 1990 and it was it was actually quite amazing and uh, the and probably one of the reasons why it was so amazing was because my mother uh, graciously made raviolis that night so that really helped it was a perfect pairing <laughs> speaking of perfect pairings do you believe in following the rules of red wine, red meat, white wine, fish, or do you break the rules? No, no, absolutely. Rules are meant to be broken. There's enough terroir and complexity around uh, both varietals that you can find a very elegant red that can surprise you with, um, you know, with a, with a you know beautiful fatty you know piece of fish that's that's uh, cooked in a certain way. Uh, you can find a monster white, um, and there's lots of them in Napa, uh, that can pair with uh, beautiful pork tender wine. I mean, there's, there's no limits. Do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety? No, no, definitely not. It, that's like saying uh, if there's such a thing as a perfect color. Uh, you know, uh, colors are meant to be blended, and uh, as much as we love sometimes to enjoy a variety on its own, Thank goodness there's a rainbow of varieties out there to choose from. What is your opinion of wine critics and scores? You know, I think that they they do provide um, an important basis for the early taster. You know, particularly when someone is early in their, you know, collecting, consuming, um, uh, you know, entering the world of wine, it, it's, it's helpful like any kind of uh, review or, or score score based, it's helpful to understand that your 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 dollars going towards uh, quality. But I think most people uh, begin to develop their own uh, direction and their own list of likes, and they end up becoming more confident in their own purchase. But I think it, you know, like every consumer good out there, as particularly luxury goods, it's helpful to have that uh, expert critic's mind to help you, you know, guide you down the right path, at least initially. So what do you think that a non-drinker loses out by not drinking your wine? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I think that along the way, um, somebody uh, will, you know, if they, when, you know, if or when they discover our wines, they're going to they're going to discover uh, a special piece of Napa and a special technique I think uh, that that we bring to the table focused on tradition uh, terroir and technology and 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 um, we we have a lot 
uh, of, of uh, this is a unique estate that brings a lot of breadth and complexity to the wines. And uh, it, it's wonderful to get to discover every corner of Napa Valley. And I, I have to think that we have a special corner of Napa Valley. So if space aliens were to land on your property, what would you share with them? Which wines? <laughs> well, as, assuming they're not hostile, I would uh, probably, if I, you know, if I had to, to, to show anybody for the first time at a property, I'd probably start with our, with our uh, flagship cabs because uh, hopefully we show them what we do best. So, uh, quick questions. As a wine consumer, do you prefer red, white, or rosé? Definitely depends. I, I need all three. Um, you know, you, you, you can't, you, you know, it's the Swiss Army Knife collection of survival. And we all, we need rosé to be out there. Uh, and uh, you have to have all three, so all three. <laughs> and do you have a preference of still or sparkling? You need both. You need both. You need sparkling in the fridge at all times. We we don't live. Um, our our refrigerator is absolutely full with between three to six bottles of something bubbles uh, at any given time because you never know when you're going to need to celebrate something. And are those bubbles primarily champagne, or do you drink from other regions? I definitely have. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a fruit. If you, maybe, maybe, maybe two or three of them are Rune Arts or, or some other special. But I have to say, uh, I, I, I like Schramsberg, and I like having some domestic bubbles in, in the fridge too. And, uh, and uh, uh, you, you need both. They, they're different, just like just like in the in the still wines. Um, it's nice to have a little bit of both. And um, you know, when you've had a little too much of wine, do you have any special remedies for hangovers? that you recommend or <laughs> uh, absolutely normally if you show up at my mother's house around uh, between 7 and 8 in the morning there's usually an amazing aroma as she's baking the empanadas for the day and my mother's empanadas can cure any illness uh, any uh, headache any bad mood and they've been doing so for me since I was a small kid because they've been in my lunchbox and they're still in my lunchbox today. So my mother's empanadas are something magical. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't all get to share those. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, um, you know, they say that each vintage tells a different story. And I think you would agree with that as we've been talking about your property and how it's very terroir driven. Um, do you find that there are more things that repeat themselves or the opposite every year? I feel like recently there's less and less repetition. Blame it on the climate. Blame it on you know shifting styles. Um, but in the last ten years, as compared to the ten years before those, I feel like nature and and everything has kept us a little more on our feet. And so we um, we're not really able to settle into a repetition. And uh, particularly with fires and floods and and, uh, and and other natural, you know, climate, you know, climate-based changes that we're going through, um, being more on top of and more alert to the vines cycle has uh, has has been a you know an important strategy in in deriving qualities consistently year over year. So I know that you are not the winemaker here. You oversee the entire business, and you've got a winemaking team of three people. Um, but do you have any good luck rituals for when harvest is about to start? Uh, actually, yes. I, I, I have to say I'm a little superstitious. Um, there are uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a pair of boots I, I never not wear uh, during harvest. Um, rubber sold, of course, because of the slippery floors in the winery. There's a lucky coin. And there is also uh, a lucky keychain. So yeah, there's there's a there's a, there's a little laundry list of things um, to, for things to go right during harvest, and we need all the luck we can get sometimes. Are there any signs or omens each year that uh, you look for that will predict the outcome of a harvest? <laughs> uh, nothing too mystic, but uh, you know, I, I, I the vines themselves uh, start telling the future pretty early on in the year. So watching things like berry set, how tall the canopy growth gets before you need to top the vine. Um, 
Verasion is actually a big indicator. There's a lot of little things that if you pay attention close enough, uh, the vines will tell you a little bit how harvest is going to go. And so hopefully, if you, you, know, if you listen, listen carefully, uh, there won't be too many surprises. So um, I just had the pleasure of walking through this large, multi-leveled winery with you. And I know that it's gravity fed, everything starting at the top and working its way down. Um, but obviously with two floors with barrels on it. Um, you have tours all the time and people are passing by the barrels, including yourself as you guide the people through. So many producers are known for walking into the cellars and talking to their wine in the barrels. Do you ever talk to the wine in the barrels? And what do you say? Even when you're, whether you're alone with the barrels or whether you have a tour following you along? You know, I, 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 um, I don't think I have much to say to them, uh, but I will say that I have caught Tina on occasion. Um, you know, when you walk around these caves, uh, there's not a lot of secrets that can be said. The echo carries your voice uh, sometimes uh, all the way around these long cavernous spokes that we have. And you can hear things, and you'll walk towards the voices, and you'll find your winemaker all alone with a glass in hand, uh, saying some interesting things to the wines. Knowing Tina, she's never embarrassed. She's a very confident woman. And uh, I, I, I never really quite know what she's saying, but she's definitely talking to the wine. <laughs> <laughs> so some people read tea leaves at the bottom of a cup to predict the future or tell them something. If you could read the bottom of a red wine glass, what would you like it to reveal? Well, hopefully a very healthy tartrate uh, uh, sedimentation structure. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but no, it, you know, um, really when I look at the bottom of, uh, of an empty glass, I'm, I'm really just hoping if there's a little bit more in the, in the, in the, in the bottle, so. <laughs> when you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, that's tough. When I was little, I was watching Palma's Vineyards become uh, what it is. And what I wanted to do was be a part of this place. I just really didn't know how. Um, I knew I never really had the stylistic intuition to be a great, one of the great winemakers in Napa Valley and, and, and being fortunate enough to, to, to work with some of the best winemakers in our industry. Um, all I knew is I wanted to be around and be a part of this I just didn't really know how to do that, and that's what took nearly half a lifetime to figure out. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you ended up studying and what your contribution has been here? Yeah, you know, it's not—it's a little unusual to end up with a computer science degree in the, uh, in the wine industry. You know, at the time, I uh, was truly fascinated by the winemakers and the process they underwent to do their craft. And I spent a lot of time uh, observing, you know, these truly these artists do their jobs, and I felt that 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 I, I was witnessing a lot of distractions take place. And so, what I felt the best thing I could contribute to the uh, to the to the process was to help use technology and and um, and help of you know deal with the mundane details so that they could get you know, more time spent on the things that really drive the stylistic direction of, of the process. You know, if you think about it, you know, uh, guys like me, we make, we, make, we make paint, we make colors on a palette. Winemakers take our paint and they paint paintings. And so um, what, what, what I try to do is build solutions around the process so that they get to spend more time with brush to canvas. And so just in brief, a quick example of what you've done is called Felix. And I just think it's fascinating. So maybe you could give us a, a very brief, I know that's hard because it's a pretty amazing system, but what is Felix? So Felix is a, kind of the shortest way I could explain it. Basically, it's an assistant. Um, Felix is an acronym. It stands for Fermentation Intelligent Logic Control System. And it's basically a machine learning algorithm designed to anticipate and, 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 and essentially uh, adapt to the ever-changing environment of the fermenter. But really what it's, what it's doing is it's focusing on maintaining 
and uh, controlling everything surrounding fermentation health. So these are things related to the temperature of the fermenter, uh, monitoring how the conversion of available sugar to alcohol is undergoing, everything related to the things that you can put numbers to. And it's doing this so that the winemaker can focus on all the things that we can't put numbers to, things that you can see, smell, taste, or feel, because ultimately, the only instrument that really makes great wine in this world is the one you can carry, and we call it a glass. And that's what we want the winemaker to have in her hand, because that's really what is driving her creative thought. So when you're not working, how do you spend your free time? You know, we, we have a uh, property up in Plumas County. We have a 100% grass-fed Wagyu operation, and we love to go up there and, and uh, ride horses and, and be in the country and uh, get away a little bit from uh, very uh, busy uh, <laughs> life of Napa Valley, which is a total joke because it's not busy at all. But um, so we bounce back and forth, but we like to, we like to stick around. We like to be here, and uh, this... This is, it's, you know, this is not, never has felt like a job, uh, and, and, and it, it, I, I doubt it's going to start feeling like one anytime soon. Are there any particular sports that you like to participate in? I like tennis. Uh, uh, tennis is one of those sports you can, you can play fit, out of shape. Uh, <laughs> you can play for your whole life as long as you don't uh, roll an ankle, but uh, you can play poorly, you can play well, but uh, that's why I love tennis. It's, it's a it's adapted with uh, aging <laughs> quite well. Um, do you have a favorite group or singer? Just coming from Bottle Rock, I have to say that uh, the Killers were, were pretty awesome this year. And do you have a favorite film dedicated to wine? Oh, that's 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 impossible. There's a bunch of great documentaries that come to mind. There's a bunch of cheesy movies that come to mind. Uh, I recently saw uh, A Walk in the Clouds, which is... Uh, was a little bit startling considering we just had one of the largest fires in California history and uh, watching a vineyard explode into flames I have to tell you it's uh, that's not quite the way it works out in fact the vineyards are really hard to print <laughs> out but uh, Keanu Reeves uh, did a good job putting it out and uh, and saving the family farm there so <laughs> I know you said you have a four-year-old but on those uh, romantic evenings that you get with your wife what wine would you order Oh, you know, when I'm at a restaurant um, and I have the expertise of a highly trained uh, psalm and, and, a, and a tremendously great wine list, uh, we, we love to say, feed us. And uh, we like to be surprised. So it's whatever he's in the mood for. And uh, probably the only thing we'll definitely order would be some bubbles to start. But beyond that, bring it on. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Probably the best piece of advice is the advice I probably constantly get from my mother, which is, uh, you know, she's constantly saying, well, there's always tomorrow. Sometimes this business can, can feel difficult. Sometimes uh, the vintage can be going great and uh, nature will have a different path for you. Um, and sometimes you feel like you just have to look forward to the next year, but uh, and the reality is we always somehow find a way to work it out because, like she says, there's always tomorrow. And if you could offer us some advice today, what advice would you give us? Uh, don't worry too much about cellaring the wines. Drink them. They're, you know, uh, yes, it's true. Maybe they'll reward you for every day you don't drink them. But who knows what's coming tomorrow? So there's nothing like today. <laughs> what would you say today is your proudest achievement in your work? When, when, when Felix came online... It took a couple years to really see the effects. Being able to, 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 uh, to see the results of an elevated human element in the wine, I think is very special. And, you know, some people were, were a little unsure as to how a, a machine learning algorithm, uh, which is not really prevalent in our industry, would affect the sort of natural style that is built into our product. Um, but when I first saw the sort of higher level of engagement and I saw that, that kind of raw talent and, and artistic in instinct that the winemakers have get elevated, that's when I felt that we were onto the right track. So complete the sentence. 
A table without wine is like... Uh, a table you walk past. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of wines do you think we'll be drinking in the year 2300? 2300. Or beyond, <laughs> if we'll still be drinking wine. Well, let's, let's really hope we still have wine in the year 2300. Who knows? Maybe, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting. I, I think, I, I hope, um, you know, if you think about it, wine's gotten about here for 2,200 years, so why not another 2,200? I think we may see some changes in its packaging, but uh, I think our forefathers would be pretty disappointed with us if in just, you know, 300 years, we end up changing something that they've kept alive for 2,200. So let's hope nothing. Let's hope it looks the same. What are three wines you would want to take with you to a deserted island? Let's see. What you, what you, you know, on a deserted island, you're going to need a lot of um, substance. So I think the most subs- substance want, you know, style wines out there are going to be uh, your Cabernet. Uh, you're going to need to stay hydrated, so rosé is important, and um, you know, and 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 maybe some spirits so that you can. Uh, uh, so maybe some eau de vies would be great so that you can help start fires. <laughs> <laughs> If a VIP person from any walk of life was photographed by paparazzi in a restaurant and on the table is one of your bottles sitting there in all its glory, it gets caught in the shot. Who would the famous, which famous person would you like to be in that photo drinking your wine? Well, let's see. There's a, there's a double-edged sword sometimes because you never know uh, what exactly they're doing. <laughs> so let's go with somebody uh, safe like Morgan Freeman. Uh, Morgan Freeman, I, I, and if I had to send him a bottle of wine to his table, I'd probably send him the Gaston Cabernet. It's a single vineyard varietal. It's bold. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's rather expensive, so it says he's celebrating something important, and uh, uh, hopefully he enjoys it. <laughs> what winemaking area in the world would you still like to explore? Um, China. You know, China is, uh, it's, it's one of those places, uh, I, I think China is incredibly determined to have a winemaking region. And uh, it's unusual, uh, no winemaking region in the history of the globe has ever been able to say this late in the game, uh, let's build a, a valley of vineyards here. And that's pretty unique. And with the modern technology and the experience expansiveness of that continent, uh, there is bound to be a pretty darn good environment to grow some pretty good grapes. Well, before we finish today, just a couple quick questions that we like to play with wine soundtrack, wine and music, important combination. So I'm just going to name a couple different grapes and I want you to tell me what, what songs are conjured up in your head. What would you want to be listening to? What would you, what does it make you think of? Um, so since we're in the heart of Napa Valley, let's start with the Cabernet Sauvignon. Probably, you know, if we're going with a single varietal Cabernet from, from Napa, uh, let's go with maybe Art Tatum. <laughs> <laughs> you know, orchestral Art Tatum, not, not, not soloist Art Tatum, but uh, because uh, it's not that raw, but, uh, you know, maybe some Art Tatum would be great. And you were telling me earlier that your mom's favorite wine was white burgundy, or where she identifies Chardonnay to be from. So what would you pair with a white burgundy? Um, let's go with uh, Adele. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what about a Malbec from Argentina? Well, I'm not going to say tango, because I feel like that's what everybody would say. So let's do something totally different. You know, Malbec uh, is, is, is all about, uh, you know, I, I, I think it, it, it's one of the, of all the vinifera, I think it's the one that pairs best with foods cooked by fire. And so uh, maybe we need something uh, a little more outdoorsy. So let's go with some bluegrass. <laughs> Well, Christian, thank you so much for joining us today. And before we go, if you could just remind us where people can find your wines and, um, you know, how they can visit you. So Palmas Vineyards is uh, mostly sold direct to consumer. About over 85% of our wines are uh, sold via our club, our, our, our wonderful process members. We invite you to come visit. You can visit us online at www.palmasvineyards.com. All of our tours are by appointment. 
Only private experiences are very special. Um, and support our, our, uh, the, the many fine restaurants around the United States and, and also abroad that carry some of our, our wines. And oftentimes you'll find some back vintage uh, specials that we haven't had for years in the winery. So uh, we're not a large producer. The wines are out there. And uh, we'd love to, to, to have, to have uh, anyone come visit. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I do encourage people to come here because the experience is a tour of this very large vertical winery, as well as a tasting um, of food and wine pairing. So it's a wonderful experience. And thank you so much for today. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.